All right, we've already had an introduction to attribution theory. In this lesson, we're going to examine some of the research on what's called the fundamental attribution error. We'll look at some data, and then we'll try to model that error based on our distinction between automatic and controlled processes in the brain. So just to recap the attribution process. Well, attribution theory is a description of the way in which people explain the causes of their own and other people's behavior. And remember, we made uh, two sort of types of, or we discussed two types of attributions. We can categorize them as internal, like beliefs and values and personality, and external, situational factors. In fact, the literature sometimes has two other words besides these. Sometimes the internal attributions are called dispositional attributions, and the external attributions are called situational attributions. So the nature of the error is the following. Uh, researchers have found a tendency to overestimate the extent to which a person's behavior is due to internal dispositional factors and underestimate the role of situational factors. So keep that in mind as we look at the data. This is the pattern that has been found in a, in a wide variety of studies in this area. In the literature, you'll also see reference to the correspondence bias, another name for this. Uh, for the fundamental attribution error. And this is the tendency to infer that people's behavior corresponds to or matches their disposition, right? personality, core values, etc. So sometimes you'll see these two terms uh, used in the literature. They refer to the same basic process. So here's one of the classic studies done back in the 70s, the College Bowl study. And uh, participants were randomly assigned to play the role of either quiz master, contestant, or observer. So it's going to be sort of like a trivia game. The quiz masters were asked to compose 10 challenging but not impossible questions for the contestants, and the observers uh, monitored the game. Of course, the contestants tried to answer the questions. At the end of the game, all of the people in the study, the quiz masters, the contestants, and the observers, all of them rated how knowledgeable the contestant and the quiz master were. Okay, uh, how knowledgeable, like intelligence, would be a, a measure. They were asked several things. One of which uh, is uh, how intelligent did they think the contestant or the quiz master was. Now, if you if if you think about it, the game is rigged, right? It's rigged against the contestant uh, because most people can think of questions that that others cannot answer. So the quiz masters, because they get to come up with the questions, of course they're going to come up with questions that they know the answers to, and they're going to make the contestants look stupid, right? Um, so keep this in mind. This is a situational factor that um, is at play here, giving an advantage to the quiz masters in this game with the contestants. So what were the results? Well, here we see the results. Uh, Y-axis, low intelligence, high intelligence. Observers, contestants, quiz masters. Um, and the green here, these are the judgments then about the quiz masters, the blue, the contestant, right? So from the ob observer's point of view, the observers, they rated the quiz masters as having higher intelligence than the contestants. Right? Right, the quiz masters, remember, they, they got to make the questions and they knew the answers. And the contestants, of course, were going to be stumped uh, 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 at least some of the time, right? Uh, the contestants also rated the quiz masters of higher intelligence than themselves, right? And the quiz masters did so too. So there was agreement that the quiz masters were more intelligent, right, than the contestants. Now this is taken to be an example of the fundamental attribution error because uh, it seems that all three uh, categories of individuals here, they are overlooking an important situational factor, right? So just take the observers here. Um, remember, you know, why would you think the quiz masters uh, are more intelligent that, than the contestants? Well, the quiz masters knew a bunch of, uh, you know, all the answers, and the quiz masters only knew some. But what they seem to be failing to correct for is the fact that the, when, if the quiz masters get to choose the questions, of course they're going to choose questions that they know the answers to, right? And so psychologists interpreted this as a kind of error that observers were failing to correct for the situational factor that the quiz masters got to choose which questions they asked. Right. Okay. Uh, 
that's sort of a summary of what I was just saying. Here's another study, classic study, um, the Castro study. Now here, subjects were asked to rate the pro-Castro sentiments of students after reading their essay. All right, there are two conditions. So the, the judges, the subjects in the, in the experiment, they either knew that students could choose to write a pro or anti-Castro essay, or that the students were assigned to write a pro-Castro or anti-Castro essay. All right? And the subjects were the, the judges. They were rating the essays. And what they had to do was, was make an attribution. Did, did the writer of the essay have a pro-Castro attitude? So let's take a look. What, what did they find? First of all, on the left here is what we might predict would happen, our sort of expectation. So here we have y-axis. This is uh, attributed pro-Castro attitude. So the higher bar means that the writer of the essay had a, a higher pro-Castro attitude. They were more pro-Castro. Um, in the choice condition, right, when the readers of the essay, the judges, the subjects of the experiment, when they knew that a student could choose to write a pro-Castro essay, well, when they were reading a pro-Castro essay, they made an attribution of a positive pro-Castro attitude, right? So they were reading a pro-Castro essay. They know the, uh, the student chose to write pro-Castro essay, so the readers were making an attribution of uh, a high pro-Castro attitude. And on the other hand, if they were reading an anti-Castro essay, they made the corresponding attribution that the writer of the essay had a, a negative uh, attitude towards Castro. Right? Now it's interesting to think about what would happen in the no-choice condition though. So in the no-choice condition, each essay, right, the student was assigned to write uh, either a pro or anti-essay. So you might think there would be no difference then in these conditions. After all, if a reader is, is reading a pro-Castro essay, they might think to themselves, well, they were assigned to write that, so I can't really make an attribution one way or the other. And the same reasoning would apply for reading an anti-Castro essay. So we might think there would be maybe no difference between the conditions. Or you might think that, well, everybody in America you know, uh, hates Castro, so maybe everybody's just going to have a negative uh, attitude towards Castro. But nevertheless, uh, we'll, we'll use this as just our, our, our theoretical prediction here. Well, what actually happened? That's over here. And here we can see that um, the results in the actual experiment for the choice condition were very similar to what was predicted. All right, so if the readers were reading a pro-Castro essay, they made a pro-Castro uh, uh, attribution that the writer of the essay was pro-Castro. They had a pro-Castro attitude. Likewise, if they were reading a negative uh, or an anti-Castro essay, they made the corresponding attribution, a, a, an anti-Castro attitude. But look at what happened in the no-choice condition. Remember, in this condition, reader, uh, the, uh, the students were assigned to write either pro or anti, yet readers still, when they were reading a pro-Castro essay, they made a significant attribution, a pro-Castro attribution in terms of the attitude of the writer. Now, not as much as, as when they knew that the student could choose to write a pro-Castro essay, but nevertheless, that's a, a significant positive attribution, right? Um, and take a look at the, the anti-Castro essay here. They were a little bit more than in the choice. They were uh, attributing a an anti-Castro attitude. So researchers took this as, as another example of this attribution error, that the readers were not um, sufficiently taking into account the situational factor that the students were being assigned to these essays. It's as if when you're reading a pro-Castro essay, it was just very easy to attribute a pro-Castro attitude to the writer of the essay, right? Um, and it, it, that being easy, psychologists called that th this an error because you might think that the, the situational factor should correct for that tendency to make that attribution. Notice that in terms of correspondence, right, uh, the observer is saying that the attitude corresponds to the behavior that they're seeing. They're reading a pro-Castro essay, and they, they make an attribution that corresponds to what they were reading, a pro-Castro attitude. 
Now, this research was done mostly on college students, like a lot of research in the last 50 years, and so uh, uh, contemporary researchers, just a few years ago, a group uh, um, headed by uh, Linda Skitka, uh, she uh, did a similar type of study, but with the general population. And they used a similar model, the essay uh, paradigm, except that they didn't use Castro essays, they used affirmative action essays. And so I'll show you two uh, affirmative action essays. Here's the uh, anti-affirmative action essay. Affirmative action is a problem for society because it violates the basic commitment America has to provide equal opportunity for to all, etc. You can pause it here if you want to read the rest of the essay. And here's the here's the uh, the positive affirmative action essay. Affirmative action is good for society because it supports the basic commitment America has to provide equal opportunity for all. And, and here's the rest. You can pause that if you want to read the rest. That's actually these are nice statements of the positions that different people have in our in our society. So again, the the negative affirmative action essay and the positive affirmative action essay. So just like in the Castro case, right, the, the readers here are going to be reading one or the other and then making an attribution. Did the writer have, uh, what kind of attitude did the writer have? Did they have a pro or an anti affirmative action attitude? Well, the results were similar to the Castro study. So I'm just going to uh, use the same bars here. Basically in the choice condition, when the readers knew that the students could choose, um, they made the corresponding attributions. If they're reading a pro-affirmative action uh, essay, they attributed a pro-affirmative action attitude and for the negative, the negative attitude. But again, in the no choice condition, the situational constraint where students were assigned to the two groups, uh, readers still made an attribution that corresponded to what they were reading. Another example of the fundamental attribution rule. Finally, uh, we can think about how the attribution error might come into play on a daily basis as we consume advertising. So if you think about advertising, what's going on, right? So a company is going to pay some guy to smile and say, I love this shaver, right? So advertisers, you can think of it this way, they're sort of counting on the fact that we will still believe that the guy really likes the shaver and discount the situational explanation that he is getting paid to say it, right? So we see the guy and he likes it, right? And it, it, it's easy for us to, to make that attribution. Yeah, I see that he likes it. He's saying it. He's smiling. He's loving it. And yeah, okay, he must really like it. But what may be happening here, psychologists would argue, is that um, if, if there's a tendency to make this attributional error, then what might be happening is that we're failing to correct for the situational factor here, namely that the actor is getting paid right, by the company to say that. So uh, just think about that. Next time that we, you're, you're, you're looking at any kind of advertising, we can now sort of uh, see it through the lens of attribution theory. When we make, make an inference that the, the person on TV really does like the product, we may be suffering from an attribution error. So in the, rem in the uh, remainder of the lesson, we'll try to figure out the cause of the fundamental attribution error.